Mike Biffle, what is your favourite game? My favourite game is Metal Gear Solid. I grew up, um, we always had computers. My dad worked in IT, uh, so I think generally, basically, once a computer was a little bit out of date, it would get lost um, and end up in our house. Um, and uh, so I grew up with like black and white Windows 311 computers, um, fiddling around with them, but never really playing games beyond like solitaire. Um, didn't have any games consoles. Didn't really have. Didn't have a SNES. Didn't have a Mega Drive. Didn't have any of the kind of the consoles that my friends had. Um, I don't know why. I think I think my parents just you know weren't that keen on games consoles and generally didn't like cluttering up the living living room. Um, so for me, those kind of very early experiences with SNES and Mega Drive were always around friends' houses. You know, I'd, I'd invite myself over and, and play, you know, Super Mario over and over again. So I've played the first level of many of those games many, many times. Um, but then, um, you know, I'd play a few things. I played a lot of kind of the Apogee kind of PC games, uh, DOS games that were out. Played a lot of kind of graphic adventure games, those kind of things. Basically, stuff that was on PC, I would, I would. I would play. Um, Name a few examples. Like. Few examples. So, I mean, the the, the, the Apogee stuff. A uh, lot of Command the Keen. A lot of Keen. Mm. Um, I remember really loving a game called Hocus Pocus, uh, which was a platformer, which was just fantastic. Or at least I remember it being fantastic. I I worry that it wasn't. Um, in terms of graphic adventure games, um, Full Throttle was. I love that. I've got really strong memories of sitting eating eating pizza. And playing full throttle on uh, on my dad's mate's computer because uh, I needed something to do in the office, and I think I think no one really knew what the age rating on the game was. <laughs> <laughs> it's an eye-opening experience, um, and I loved. I remember playing uh, Simon the Sorcerer, which probably I imagine wasn't that well known outside of the UK. Um, and likewise, Discworld, uh, graphic adventure games. So I was playing all of those, uh, but my first console experience was Dreamcast. Um, oh, a lot more recent. Yeah, a lot more recent. I, uh, so I was in my kind of, I guess, my mid-teens and just started playing Dreamcast and just consumed everything I could on the Dreamcast. Um, loved Shenmue. Um, I had a real affection for a game I think history's kind of forgotten called uh, Headhunters. Oh, yes, I, 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 I do was, remember Headhunters, yeah. It was kind of kind of stealthy, stealth with vehicle sections, basically. And it was... I like. I'm sure it wasn't very good, but I remember really enjoying that game, um, and and just working my way through it and and loving it. Um, and yeah, just played a lot of Dreamcast, and and at that point I was hooked. So that was the point where you know got my Saturday job, got a PlayStation Two, got you know um, an Xbox, and and from that point on, just I've played and owned every games console that was kind of the, the, the moment for me but it was kind of in my teens that i got into games in a big way um pc games up until that point and i still stuck with pc games so i was i was playing a lot of first person shooters on the pc and uh, and a lot of kind of um yeah a lot of tie-ins i remember playing every, pretty much every star trek tie-in game there was because i'm a massive star trek nerd as a kid I was obsessed with Star Trek, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. So I didn't have a PlayStation One get, uh, at all. So uh, the uh, my favourite game selection there that is the PC port uh, that I adored as a kid, which is uh, which is an interesting because it wasn't the best version by a long way. Oh, interesting. We can touch upon that, but I find uh, we can touch upon that when we get to the game itself. But that, wow, I'm I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> that was well that was just the way I played. That was the way I played it. Oh, well, fair enough, fair enough. But I figured you might have gotten into it after you got your PS2. No, no, no. I'll, I'll tell you the full story when we get to it, but yeah, it was not a game that was in my on my radar at all. Ah. But yeah. Okay. Um so 
talk of um, how you got into the industry side of things. Um, so the industry thing, I didn't really realize you could work in video games. And you still see this when I talk to like young kids. I've, I'm often wheeled out by like family members as the, the, to, to kind of tell their kids to work harder in maths. Uh, if they want to be allowed to work on Call of Duty games, that's basically what I get. The number of times that like I've I've been like at a Christmas like family event, and uh, and like a very leading question from from uh, a distant family member of like, so Mike, um, you use uh, your maths and science a lot when you're making computer games, don't you? I'm like, yes, I do. I'm very glad I got qualifications, so I'm often wheeled out in that sense. Um, so I wasn't, but I wasn't really, I wasn't really aware that you could do it. I wanted to be, I knew I wanted to work on games. Um, and I guess because it was the most visible aspect of it, I wanted to be an animator. I wanted to work as a, because I, I, I thought that that was what games basically were, that you'd have kind of, computers did the game stuff and then an artist or an animator came in and did the the models and the meshes and stuff i didn't really have a very good idea of what it was so i went so i actually kind of um i kind of taught myself went to to, built up like my a levels i built up kind of a bunch of courses that i thought were in some way relevant so i did like 3d design and photography there was nothing game centric so i just kind of pieced together what i could and then when i got to the kind of degree stage I, i tried to get an animation course um, in Wales, uh, at Newport University, as it was then called, um, and uh, I turned up to the interview and this, and you know was asked, you know, why do you want to learn animation? I said, oh, I really want to work on computer games, and started describing things I liked in computer games. Um, and the lecturer was like, well, we're starting a, a game design degree. Do you want to be on that? And I didn't really know what game design was, so I was like, yeah, okay, that sounds more computer gamey. <laughs> and kind of fell into it from that direction. And, 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 you know, I loved games, but I didn't realize that game design was a thing that people could do as a job. Uh, so did that, did a, got a degree in that, um, and then managed to get a job uh, kind of straight after uni um, at a company called Blitz Games, who did a lot of licensed kind of uh, games. And that was where I really learned how to how to get things done. I think I kind of, I think I... I yeah, worked on about five games there, uh, mm-hmm. so with quite quick turnaround. So you you learn very quickly how video games get made, um, and that was a that was a cool experience. So then, yeah, after that, in my spare time, I was working on a hobby game, which was Thomas was alone. Um, this kind of evenings and weekends thing. Moved to London because a friend started uh, Boston Studios, so I kind of came down to be his lead designer there. And uh, and yeah, Thomas was alone was always on the back burner and took like two years to make kind of evenings and weekends and when that came out obviously it kind of it did quite well and I got to kind of quit the day job and and set out on my own so that's that's the potted history. Let's touch upon your favorite game, MGS One. Yes. Um, so let's touch back to that story. How the hell did you not play the PS One version on the PS Two? Why the PC version? So I'd never heard of Metal Gear Solid, and I wasn't like growing up. I kind of grew up in a way that now seems really weird, just really sheltered, like not in any way aware of kind of Asian culture at all. Like I like I, I knew I knew the vague things. I knew Akira was a thing, but I couldn't really describe it. Um, and I knew the Matrix was kind of based on some Japanese cartoon stuff, but I didn't really know anything about it. And it, look, looking back, it's really weird to me how little I was aware of kind of that kind of culture stuff. Um, I guess the closest I came was I was a big Transformers geek as a kid. So I guess I was soaking up some of it through that, but not, you know, not any kind of awareness. And because I, I guess probably as well, because I'd been playing games predominantly on PC, um, I'd been playing mostly stuff by Western developers. So I didn't have that, that awareness really. Yeah. Um, so, so one day my, uh, my dad's mate knew I was into computer games, knew I had a PC and, and played games on it. And, uh, and he brought around this, uh, this spy game um, and that's how he described it to me. So it's this spy game. It's kind of, kind of like an '80s action movie, um, and you have to sneak around, and you, you know, you basically have to save the world. And he was like, "There's this ladder, 
Um, and if you climb up and down it, like, multiple times, there's this woman, and you see her in her bra. <laughs> that, that, that can really sell it. And, I, and that was the thing, was I, at 14, I was like, oh, it's a spy game with nudity, wow! <laughs> and it just, it just seemed interesting and, and cool. And then I remember, like, installing it on my PC. And it was an okay port, like, it, it had its problems, but it was an okay port. But this is a kid who's never really played console games, doesn't really have a mu much awareness of, like, the rules of console games, hasn't really got much awareness of kind of Japanese culture, or, you know, mech stuff, that kind of sense of humour, the kind of all of this stuff. And I'm thinking I'm sitting down to play basically like a die-hard game. So it just blew me away. It just completely... I didn't... There were things where I wasn't sure if it was buggy. I was like, why... Why is that character like like flicker like a psychomantis scene? Mm. Why is it flickering and going over there and 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 that that whole thing where there's a moment with the codec where you have to kind of find the number on the box? Like this was mind blowing to me. I played really quite safe American uh, PC games, so just being exposed to a game world where you hid in a box. And the guards couldn't see you if you didn't move because you were in a box, or that you use a cigarette to see lasers. Just it just was so inventive and strange and kind of like really foreign in a literal sense, just completely outside my experience. They just blew me away, and I just remember playing it over and over and over again, just trying to find every inch of that content and just having no idea and the other thing which looking back i think was was something which obviously i have context on now was the pc version came out um and it incorporated both the single player kind of the the regular metal gear experience and then the vr hmm. um so you have the story mode and the vr mode um and i had no clue that they they were set released as separate games or the one was an add-on so it was this game where you had like a story stuff that was all set in a real world and this vr environment stuff which was completely off the wall murder mystery mini games and stuff and just yeah just completely shocked me and, and just was kind of the game that that i just was was just introduced to this whole world of of potential games out there um and then yeah that was that fueled me to then kind of get more into console stuff and um yeah i got my ps2 specifically because i wanted to play Metal Gear solid 2 just the idea of getting to have that experience again just was amazing to me um so yeah it blew my little mind um did you ever get round to playing the ps1 version eventually i've yeah i've since gone back i've never i've never played it i've never played the ps1 version on a ps1 but yeah I've, i tracked down a copy and and have played it on ps2 i think i own it digitally now as well so i can play it on the on the on the playstation 4 and stuff um on the vita as well i think i've got yeah it's like a crossplay thing so yeah um i've played it yeah i've, I've played it on its native platform and there's there's it, it definitely works better on thumbsticks than it does on a wasp keyboard and that's i mean we'll talk about volume eight, but that was one of the fun challenges of volume was how the hell do you actually make stealth feel good on wasp because it's such because it's such a fiddly kind of way of doing interactions um so yeah so it was uh yeah I've, I've gone back and played it the way it was intended um and stuff makes a lot more sense like the whole obviously the unplugging controller thing doesn't happen on pc um so that kind of content seeing that stuff i think i can't remember how they did it on pc i think you had to i think they did it like you had to click buttons on the keyboard or something it, it wasn't as as beautiful i think i think actually the, vo the voiceover mentions like the making the controller rumble which if you haven't got the context you have no idea what's going on um <laughs> but for, for, for me it just added to that weirdness i was just completely blown away anyway so so that added bit of what the hell's going on was by that point that was kind of my way of playing the entire game i was constantly in that in that mindset uh, from a story perspective like um did you go back and play the original two metal gear games that came out before mgs1 no i never did i remember i remember pouring over because it had a fantastic manual um and I guess it was similar in both, where it had like comic book bits, like explaining the mechanics. And I remember it had like the the backstory, um, which again, like to me, because I had no idea of what Metal Gear Solid was as a cultural phenomenon, I was reading this as why do I need to know who Big Boss is? Like, why is that relevant to anything? Like, there's obviously Big Boss is is, is in Metal Gear mentioned, but it's not. It wasn't like a 
it made no sense as to why there was this this manual explaining all this backstory because I didn't know there were Metal Gear one and two um, or the or the like the shooter American two point five thing. Um, so yeah, no, I I I, had, I never played those, and to be honest, I've never gone back. Um, I should at some point. To be honest, I've always been waiting for them just to show up as like as a downloadable kind of game, and I've never seen them on uh, on any of the storefronts. But it's something I'd like to do. Um, I'm just waiting for it to pop up somewhere that you know I, I'm currently playing games on. But you can play like you can play them in the HD collection on PS3 and 360 through MGS3. Really? Yeah. Like, here's, yeah. have you not known that? I've not known that. I've got that. I mean, like you've like since two thousand six, they've been available in the West through MGS Free Subsistence. I'm feeling like a fool. I I didn't have. I did. I have Subsistence. I think I bought free when it came out. I don't think I went and bought Subsistence after the fact. But I do have the. Um, I do have the HD collection. So I will. <laughs> that's my weekend. <laughs> oh wow! This is the first. There you go. I get to go and experience that. To be fair, I've 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 played tiny bits of both, but I can never. Like you know, get very far in them because they're like notoriously difficult. Uh, so I mean, every game you go back to now feels that way, doesn't it? I mean, even to be fair, when you go back and play Metal Gear Solid One now, there's it's definitely areas where that game's not aged fantastically. No, um, the controls are really difficult in places, really ropey. That that Metal Gear thing, and it's true in two as well, where where going into cover is about pushing up against the wall, and the camera angle's always changing. Mm. It's that that classic. You know, Resident Evil problem of kind of of just completely, it's very difficult spatially. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I need to go back and play that. I will I'll check out the, uh, the 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 original Metal Gears. Um, to be fair, like I've not played the uh, uh, the original Metal Gear Solid in five years. I mean, because of like you say, of how certain aspects of it have data, like the controls. Like the first time I completed it, well, uh, like I said, was five years ago. In fact, like the first time I ever completed it, and that was oh, really uh, yeah. I mean, like this is after completing MGS two two years beforehand, and that was a game that was out five years. Mm-hmm. And uh, MGS3, uh, like the day after it came out in Europe, but like that five years ago, that was the first time I ever finished MGS1. And like you said, there are certain aspects of that game that are completely dated now, including the controls that kind of put me off playing the game again uh, uh, for a replay. It is fascinating when you go back, um, just how it's. It's to me, it's one of the big indicators that games are nowhere near as evolved as a medium as we think they are. That that we you only have to go back a few years and just like just go and try and play a Call of Duty from a few years back, even something as recent as that. The speed at which we are cleaning up in video game interaction and making games just feel better and work better is is astonishing. So no, it was one of the things when you know when I started on the current project, just I went back and replayed everything, every stealth game. Um, not obviously all the way through; that would have taken <laughs> far too much time. But I went back and played like every Metal Gear, every Splinter Cell, every Hitman, and just kind of tried to immerse myself in, in how those games worked and how they felt. Um, but yeah, I mean, the original Metal Gear has not aged fantastically. Two is better, but still, honestly, is it incorporates a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that seems dated now. But that's you know that's always the way, and I'm sure we'll look back at stuff now in exactly the same way in a few years. So let's talk over some of the game's aspects. Um, may, in particular, um, what is more or less a core principle of the series? Um, it's boss fights, Foxhound. Oh wow, yeah! Like what an incredible set of fights. Like I'm literally, like I said, it's been a while since I've played it, but like what an incredible set of boss fights they are. So incredible and so varied, and all of them using like they don't really cheat. All of them use the core mechanics of the game. It's not like you have. I think a lot of people look back at Metal Gear Solid and remember it as you know a bunch of stealth levels interspersed with boss fights, but they are all built on the same foundation. You're still using exactly the same mechanics you use in the main game um, with with the addition, obviously, of, the, of key weapons. Um, and the number of them that are really interesting spatially. Like, um, I love, 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 love the um, Vulcan Raven, Giant and Shaman, the one, the, uh, the chill, is it like, it's like in, a, in an ice room uh, mm-hmm. where you're using C4 in order to catch him and stuff. And that's like a, that's just such a lovely inversion of, of, of what is basically the standard game, which is stealthing around cube objects 
but taken and made into a really compelling boss fight. And then uh, the sniper wolf sequence where you've got the, uh, where you're again using sniping mechanics that are present in the rest of the game. You don't really use them very much. That's really the highlight of them. But but again, it's all stuff that you have throughout the rest of the game. And they, they gel really well while also feeling completely separate. And the other really great thing is how compelling those characters are. That's why the boss fights, I think, have such resonances you have a story for each of those characters. You have a framing that makes them each each of those boss fights feel so important and so so um, so integral to what to the story being told. And you know you know the complete context of each of those those fights. The, yeah, the sniper wolf sequence alone is just incredible. Just the the kind of that, that relationship with Otacon and the kind of that's a very complex relationship to, to present in a video game that kind of she's there's obviously a very very um messy relationship in that he's in love with her she's there's an implication that she's maybe used that to her benefit but doesn't share his feelings but ultimately there's a sympathy there that's a that's a lot to convey around a boss fight um and i mean sure it does it via quite complex um you know, quite a lot of cutscenes. Oh. oh, yes. Um, but you know what? It's there in the game as well, and it, and it gives such gravity to to that to that sequence and to that boss fight. So, I yeah, I mean, those boss fights are incredible in Metal Gear. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's another one as well that we'll touch upon in a bit more because of its mechanical side, but uh, a later on. But um, flipping it uh, over to the other side as well, you have also got like compe- other compelling support characters besides Snake. Um, Naomi Campbell, Meryl, Mer- oh Meryl was fantastic from uh, my yeah. my first experience with it. Um, yeah, just talk about the support characters and the flip side facts. Oh, and I forgot about Mei Ling as well. Mei Ling's amazing. Um, I mean, probably has dated a little bit. I mean, a lot of the gender politics in Metal Gear, obviously, uh, uh, are for a bit the time. Dodgy, yeah. <laughs> um, I, to, to an extent that I didn't realise as a kid. I think there's a. I, and that might have been an aspect of the time, but I think also um, the yeah, it's 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 something I think for a teenage boy is less is less equipped to to know what's going on there. But yeah, Mei Ling was fantastic. I think the relationships, the support there. The key thing, the key thing with all of those characters though, is that they is that they tell you stuff about Snake. Is that it's all feeding into that character and that power fantasy. Um, and also giving the nuance to it. So, you know, the mailing character basically is there to tell the player character, to tell the player how cool they are. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's an implication of kind of Eastern wisdom and all this stuff with the kind of the quotes she's doing, but ultimately um, she's there to fawn over you. She's a fangirl in the game, mm. um, which, which works, and, you, and it, it elevates Snake and makes him feel cool. The Meryl character is more interesting in that she's, ultimately she's there... Um, she's an agent of her own volition in the game universe. Mm. Um, she's uh, she's an equal to Snake in a lot of ways. They they make a lot of they do a lot of talk about how she's you know she's young, she's she's a trainee, she's green, she doesn't know what she's doing. But ultimately, it's established that she knows a hell of a lot of what she's doing, and she's um, an incredibly witty witty and intelligent character. Um, she falls into the damsel trope a little bit, but. Alter, but but that's that's fleeting and and most of the time she's there being a collaborator with Snake and and then that kind of emotional relationship occurs later as well which perhaps is not the game's strongest point I don't think Snake makes for a great romantic lead uh, in any game no uh, but it's there and it's interesting I like what they did with that in um, number four where they where they really make Meryl almost a better soldier than snake in a lot of ways in that game and that that really appeals to me that they they let that character keep growing past that first game yeah i, I was just about to bring that up because like what like you said um like she does fall into that damsel in distress kind of trope in one but like she evolves from it in, in four into like you know something better like She's past next. She's her own woman now. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, she is in the first game. They, it's, it feels. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. But you know, they do, they do fall. You know, there's lots of lots of cliches in that, like things like you know, she's the son of the colonel, which makes her about you know, she's a 
she's an adjunct to male characters, but they, I think they extend beyond that. I think it's a, I think it's a really cool character. Um, and yeah, I love the relationship, the, all of the secondary characters, the Colonel, um, the snake, uh, the, uh, liquid snake in disguise as what's his name? Miller. Miller. Hmm. Yeah, Miller. Yeah. 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 Um, which, which again is just, a, it's a, such a, such an 80s action movie thing to have the, the friend and mentor who turns on, sorry, spoilers, friend and mentor who turns on you and turns out to not be on your side. But it works, and they do it really well. And it plays off of how that story is, is, is given to the player. That kind of, that codex system is very intimate and very, um, very strong in the game in that it, it, it just... It creates these relationships and this bond, and they, you know, the amount of kind of filler additional content they do with the codec that, you know, you, if you call them in different scenarios or different environments, they'll react to where you are. It makes them feel just so human um, in a way that you can't really do just with cutscenes. Like, I think that's a very, I mean, I'm sure the codec was as well a way of doing more story without having to do lots of expensive animation. I'm sure that played in, but they, um, I think it's a different kind of storytelling that, yeah, just creates these these real intimate moments. Mm. Uh, in the second one, of course. Oh, messing with it. Yeah. yeah well, well, we'll touch upon MGS two and its similarities to one and a bit. Um, but, um, there's another aspect of the series that we would kind of get to know, of, uh, or at least for the first two anyways, um, which is the psychological aspect of it. Um, and more specifically, at least at first anyways, um, the Mantis fight. Yes. Like, that is just one of the best pieces of game design I've probably seen, ever. Like, flipping from one control port to the other. Yeah, I mean, it's clever because it uses the medium. And, you know, it's not... Yeah, and transcends through that. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's... I mean, a lot's been said about it, but yeah, just the way... It it frames that fight. There's um I uh, I'm b- a bit pretentious in that I actually wrote a dissertation um, on Metal Gear Solid um, at uni, comparing it to um, Brecht, uh, Bertolt Brecht, uh, who was a for those of your listeners who don't know who Bertolt Brecht is, um, he was a thirty well kind of nineteen twenties to nineteen forties. I guess he was most active uh, German uh, playwright and director. Um, who was focused on something called the Fremdung's effect, uh, alienation effect, which is basically um, the act of encouraging an audience to engage with a piece of theatre um, critically um, in terms of you know thinking about the politics being conveyed and the, the scenario and, you know, and not trying to get them to think emotionally, not trying to get them to emote with characters, um, by by believing that the world on st- as depicted on stage is real, but actively working to remind them that they are in a theatre watching a piece of theatre, so as to engage them more intellectually. Um, and the amount of kind of fourth wall breaking stuff that that Kojima does in Metal Gear Solid, um, I think he does it mainly for the laughs and mainly to, for the for the coolness of it. But at the same time, that fight by by reminding you constantly that you're playing a video game by getting you to you know get out the chair and change the controller by making the controller vibrate by checking your save files and and reading out which is by the way really fun on the twin snakes remake uh because it references all the all the the nintendo games Mm. so you know you seem to be interested in italian plumbers Uh, it's some, some lovely kind of references in there when you play on that system um but the um like doing all of that frames that fight in such a way that uh, just it just it just makes it about being it's a it's a, it's a very cool game moment but it also really puts you i think contextually better with the with the story of psychomantis like that that kind of horrific backstory that that character has uh which it looks like we might be hearing a bit more about in the new one um if the fan theories are true um but like I think I think it just it just breaks that immersion and makes it something that transcends it. Uh, because what you're saying, that kind of it's great game design. Sometimes the way to make someone think that something is great game design or that a game is really awesome is to actually punch them out of the game for a moment and say, you know, stop losing yourself in the experience. Here's a moment where I kind of frame this for you as a as a piece of game. Um, so yeah, I love that. I love that. That entire boss fight is fantastic. And then what it also does with your relationship with Meryl, of course, because you you know she, when she when she becomes part of it and becomes possessed, 
um, at a point where the player's really starting to like that character and care about that character. Um, she's not just locked in a cage to the side. You're actively fighting her. Um, that's that's very cool. That whole that whole sequence is just so well choreographed. Uh, the way you plot it, like just being like kind of punched out of the game for a second, like wake up, there's time to get a breather for a second, like that. That was a, that's a good way of explaining it. Thank you. Um, but they kind of re 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 explored that a bit as well, that kind of fight in MGS4. So they did. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, um, well, it's not that surprising considering MGS4 was basically the greatest tits compilation of the Metal Gear franchise. <laughs> it's true, it's true. But, like, they, they adapted to it because, like, at the time, like, you had the controls were wired, you had to plug them in and out, whereas uh, in MGS4, you had to press down the PS button and then just kind of switch slots. Yeah. That that was um, interesting at the time for an old concept for me. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, t I think it's a, it's a trick that, you know, K Kojima's pulled out many times in many different ways, not just the kind of the technical thing, but just, you know, putting putting mechanics into the game that are very obviously silly. You know, the cardboard box is a brilliant example of something that there's, it's not meant to be a realistic mechanic. It, it kind of worked in maybe in the, in Metal Gear Solid one because of the, 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 the kind of the, the graphical fidelity and the kind of the way the metaphor works. But, but that's been, that's been intentionally arch for many, many versions of the game. But even Metal Gear Solid 1, remember the sequence where you get the, the wolf cubs to fall in love with you? you yeah, know, I remember like, that, yeah. It's like the, it's, there's always been with Metal Gear, there's always been that, that silliness. And I think that part of the reason, or part of the effect at least on me when I play, is that it knocks me out of it. That it's, it's not about trying to create this immersive world it's about kicking you out of that world so that you you, you appreciate it a bit more and that you 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 uh engage with it on a systems level as well as on that kind of emotive level so i think it's a very clever dance that kojima has with the player in those games so another kind of psychological aspect of it was the torture chamber and this had ramifications for the end of the game if you'll remember um so um i'm going to ask you up front the first time you played through the game did you break or did you manage to make it through the torture? I I managed to make it through the torture because when I first played it through, I I think it's actually one of the more interesting parts of the game because it's 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 so rare for a game to allow you to fail. That I played it and thought, well, if I don't win this, then I don't get to keep playing the game. So I played it as if it were like yeah, a challenge in a game. Um, it didn't occur to me that you could let it let it fail i think the pc if memory serves i think the pc was a bit less punishing i think you didn't have to be quite as like <laughs> didn't require such extreme input um but yeah it was um it was a uh, it was a uh, it was just something the idea of a game letting you fail it just didn't occur to me that i was allowed to not get through that bit so yeah i, I think i got through it and and didn't think anything of it until i read somewhere oh well you don't have to you know but i think after the first completion i was like i want to go back and get, and get everything and i think i looked and realized oh that that's actually a moment where the plot changes based on what you do so it was uh yeah it didn't occur to me that you could lose that bit so i didn't let it mm. but it, but again a good example of another moment when i was playing on pc where it baffled me because i think um i think ocelot like in the intro to that sequence says you know don't use don't use a rapid fire because i'll know and I had no like, and, and that's obviously a reference to you know third party PlayStation controllers. You can set to just kind of to rapid fire a button, and then you can get through that pe that part really easily. And as a, again, as a kid who had no knowledge of console games, I, was, I just had no idea what what the character was talking about. It was just again one of those those weird idiosyncrasies that just made the game for me. Let's talk of the story side of things, or at least um, the, the sensitive uh, political side of the stories, because mm -hmm. like. Kojima is, how do we say this, Kojima is, how do we say this, very political in his stories, like they're not yeah. just uh, the kind of typical stop uh, the bodies, save the world kind of things, there's a political yeah. message to it. I think, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I got it, I was definitely, I was probably when I played Metal Gear the first time, I would guess that I was... 14 or 15 mm. um so i got it like i got the the this i got that it was yeah anti-proliferation war is bad um 
uh, war never changes, the kind of that, those core things. Didn't have the kind of the context. I don't think I was really thinking about the context of what that means from a Japanese game developer. Why you know the nuclear threat was was such a, a big part of that. Um, so I think some of it went over my head just because I didn't have the, the cultural awareness to understand kind of where a lot of that was coming from. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 it again surprised me. You know, it's not something that I was expecting in a spy game, which was how it was sold, how it was how it was described to me when I when I first picked it up. So again, some one of those things that knocked me back. Um, I, I I think it's I think it's interesting. I think Metal Gear One is pro- Metal Gear Solid One. Sorry, is probably the game that I think he achieves that goal the best. Um, I think with subsequent games. That, that that kind of Tomb Raider reboot problem of if you make the shotgun feel really good, um, it ceases to be a game about how violence is bad. Um, I think that creeps in with two onwards is is you you snap a lot of necks in these games, mm. um, and and that that message for me becomes muddier. Um, but yeah, I, he's he's got a point to make, and he makes it. I I I. I worry that some of the silliness for me kind of negated that a little bit but i think it's i think it's cool i think it's even if it's not like the world's greatest protest game um i think the fact that there is that subtext there adds so much to it and gives the game so much um so i i think, I think it was worth it and I, I enjoy that aspect of it um i think uh I think it's uh, it's it's potentially an, uh, a naive kind of political stance. Um, insofar as I don't know, it just it just it, it definitely it definitely worked for me as a teenager. But going back, I I, I kind of I do have you know some bullet point lists of questions <laughs> like so so you know war is bad, but 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 snakes okay, um, and snakes snakes the right guy and. How is that? How how do you reconcile those aspects? I don't want to use the phrase ludo narrative dissonance, but I just did. <laughs> um, <laughs> that creeps in, and I think more than any other creator, I'm willing to accept that from Kojima because because there's so many examples of him intentionally kind of adding contradiction and adding messiness that I kind of think, well, fair enough. He's that's probably his point. Um, but it's 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 a it's a part of the series I enjoy. I honestly. I think it's less successful um, than his character studies and his relationship stuff. Um, you know, the the I care more I care more about his characters than I do his politics. Um, he's very good at melodrama, um, very good at melodrama, and I think that maybe weakens the strength of these games politically. But I'm not sure it's a bad thing. I'm not sure it's a bad thing. I think it's good set dressing, but I don't think for me it's not the core of why I enjoy the games. Hmm. Um, well, we'll touch upon that towards the end of uh, Metal Gear uh, Solid t- talking about, but um, the, um, just touching upon those characters uh, slightly, not uh, so much the characters themselves, but um, the characters and, uh, well, not, sorry, not the characters, um, the, the voices that provide them. Um, yeah. Um, like we know them as obviously David Hayter, Jennifer Hale, uh, uh, et cetera, and all those and all that. And that. But a curious aspect of MGS One was that, with the exception of Hayter and someone else, I, I can't remember who, they all used pseudonyms. Yes, I've read that since. Yeah. Mm, I I when I interviewed um Jennifer Hale for Eurogamer a couple of years ago, like I, I even asked her up front, like it's been this long now since MGS One, can you explain the story behind the pseudonyms? And she said, Nope, not going to. <laughs> It's it's a bit of a weird thing, although from what I understand, they used the pseudonyms just in case the game didn't, you know, become as successful as it did. Huh. I, I, I have no idea. I think it was a different time as well, though. This kind of voice actors as stars thing is incredibly recent. Like, I mean, you know, when you look at, like, what people like Nolan North and Troy Barker and, um... Is it... Yeah, Troy, Troy Baker, sorry. <laughs> said Troy Bark, I've met him, I feel like a jerk. <laughs> um and and you know, um oh uh, various other people have have done is they've they've I think we're starting to see potentially the start of the video game star. Mm. Um in terms of uh, in terms of actors at least. Um and that wasn't the way at the time. Like I mean David Hayter um he was a it was a it was a it was a gig in between his writing, right? Like David Hayter wrote um Oh, well, I know he wrote the X-Men movie, but he's written a lot of stuff, hasn't he? He's a, yeah. um, a movie, a screenplay writer. Yeah. So for him, I guess he was just doing a gig. You know, he was just doing a job. Hmm. Um, <laughs> the idea that he was creating one of the most iconic performances ever 
uh, probably didn't occur to him in the way that it would to a young actor now. I imagine, I imagine there's actors coming up now who who specifically want to kind of emulate the Nolan North kind of model and become the the, the video game star. But uh, I doubt that was on their minds back then. This was probably just a job. I know, I know. Even now, you know, obviously, I do a lot of work with voice actors myself, and specifically voice actors agents. You know, this is not glamorous work as far as they're concerned. You know, usually a voiceover gig for most actors, it's a, it's a, it's a, I've got a free afternoon, or I'm, you know, I've, I, it's not something that people consider to be kind of a high art. You, you get actors who get it and, you know, who do lots of video games and, and see the value in them. But for a lot of actors you talk to, it's, you know, it's, 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 they see it as no different than doing, say, a voiceover on a commercial or something. It's not, it's not, they don't see the artistry in it and they certainly don't see the career kind of opportunity of being in a, in a popular video game. So I think I can understand it. I can understand it. I think that still exists to an extent. Um, I think some smart actors are realizing that they actually can can build something more. Um, I think we can touch upon that when we get to talk about volume, because obviously what you've done uh, is worth talking about. But um, it's not it's not Thank the <laughs> it's not it's not just um, the the voice uh, the voicing in that game. It's the music as well. It's oh, the re- yeah. yeah, like the reason why I bring up the voicing and the music for that game is that. It was very unprecedented at the time because, like, it was these high quality voicing, high quality music. Like, you wouldn't typically hear that in a game before Metal Gear Solid. No, I mean, and it was it was smart. I mean, it's been it was well for many years. The joke was Hideo Kojima wishes he was a filmmaker, and I've, he's been very upfront about that. You know? Oh yeah, he has. He's um he wanted to make movies. Games were the second option. Um, but I guess because of that interest and that excitement, he had a vision that maybe didn't occur to those of those of the people around him who had been like I, you know, had always wanted to make games. So I think he actually kind of pushed and kicked the industry into gear to an extent in in upping those production values and using stuff that works, like, you know, there's always these incredibly boring debates on Twitter about whether whether gameplay matters more than presentation. And the reality is they both matter massively. Um, we're, we're, it's an audio-visual medium. So it seems, in retrospect, silly that we never really stole all of the amazing stuff that the film had done up to that point. So I, th- I, I think him and others like him did an amazing effort for the industry and we're all a bit better off because of it. But yeah, I mean, the music's fantastic. That that theme is amazing. I know there's been accusations of plagiarism around it um, because it's very similar to something else, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very similar to a Russian kind of piece. There's a Russian piece and this and speed as well. I think that yeah. has, has, has a lot of stuff that's, that's similar. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's you, you, the, the, that kind of that visionary take of a of a Japanese game dev company going, we are going to take a bunch of stuff from kind of eighties American movies and incorporate it into the way we do things. That's that's amazing. And then obviously, what's what's even cooler is with Metal Gear Solid Two, uh, because of the success of the first, they got access to that Hollywood talent. You see, you know, people like Harry Gregson Williams kind of joining in and 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 taking things further and further. So it's yeah, I mean, it's it's. It's it's weird to look back at now as such a as of such a pivotal moment in the way we make games because it's it's it seems daft now that you wouldn't have voice acting um, or you know a, a really well recorded soundtrack and, and you know beautifully composed soundtrack in a in a big game. The idea of a AAA game coming out that didn't have those things it seems so alien now. It's impossible. Um, we see that in indie games, often those things are not are avoided, but that's more of a budgetary concern. I'm sure if if the people making those games have the access to that stuff, they would they would definitely want music and and probably even voiceover. Hmm. Um, what do you think uh, is the legacy that Metal Gear Solid has left, at least uh, in the stealth genre? At least. Oh well, in the stealth genre, I think it the the key thing that it introduced. Um, was uh, communication in stealth games. Um, if you look at its peers and the games that preceded it, um, they were often quite vague in their communication. Um, they were often um, basically playing more realistically. That you know, if you were, if you, if the, the, the enemies would react to you in a in a really believable way. Um, there was always that push towards real, realism in AI. Um, what Metal Gear Solid did was, I think, it, it said this is okay to be a video game um, in this space. It's okay that a god sees you, loses you, and then accepts that 
and goes back as if nothing happened. Um, because honestly, that makes it a more fun playground. Um, I think Metal Gear was amazing in that it, it definitely tried to be cinematic and tried to pull in a lot of kind of beautiful stuff from movies, but I think it also was absolutely okay with its status as a video game. And it, it kind of, for me, that's inspiring that they, they, didn't, they didn't try to produce something realistic and they never have. Um, it's going to be really interesting how the new one deals with this because obviously there's a massive jump up in visual fidelity and the environments seem more kind of believable than they, they maybe were in the past. It's going to be interesting to see if it can still keep that absolute unashamed gameplayness um, and, you know, silliness and humour, which is, I think, always a massively underestimated element of the Metal Gear franchise, just how often they will do a fart joke um, and with, with such gusto. Um, <laughs> I think that's uh, something that I'd, I'd, I'd hate to see the series lose. It's worth noting, of course, that um, in the like he obviously did do games before Metal Gear Solid One, like the, the two original Metal Gear games, and uh, as well as that Snatcher and Police Knots. But it's fair to say that Metal Gear Solid is the game that made Hideo Kojima a massive superstar. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, like after MGS One, like you you couldn't go far without seeing a Hideo Kojima game. Uh, on top of a me- on on a Metal Gear box, like um, a fun anecdote. Um, when I first finished MGS three, um, do you remember the uh, f- post credits scene, the post credits phone call with Ocelot? Um, I I do, but I don't. Go no, on, remind me of it. No, no, I'm it's, uh, it's I can remember the scene. I can remember a scene take because there's always a phone call. No, aye, it's, I it's yeah, it's not so much what's the content, what the, what the content is itself, but the fact that it took place. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, um, when I first finished it, like it was just a game logo. But when I went back to play the game on Vita last year. Like it actually had a Hideo Kojima game on it. Like it wasn't it wasn't there before. So, like I think I think that kind of tells you a lot about um how how, how kind of big of rock star um, Kojima's kind of become as of uh, MGS. In fact, like I remember a talk he gave at Bath a couple of years ago. I think I was there for that. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he was there just basically saying how he was kind of the last of a dying breed of Altairs. Yeah, I think that might be... I think what's what's happening is I think that those those people are, are still there. I think I think we're seeing this across media, um, that frankly the, the big blockbuster stuff is now bigger than than individuals in terms of how it's being promoted. They can't, they can no longer tell themselves, you know, we're, we're not getting, um, you know, new Spielbergs arriving. We're getting Marvel movies. You know, if the, the, the genius of the Marvel stuff is that they've made the suit the star, not the actor in the suit, mm. meaning that they can at any point change things up, remove, a, you know, Iron Man is an Iron Man movie. It's not a Robert Downey Jr. movie. Now, obviously he is Iron Man, but that could change any moment. Um, and I think the same is true in games. I think there are absolutely those those auteurs working in the industry. I mean, I know a few of the creative directors of the, of the big AAA stuff, and they're they're all very opinionated, very strong willed creative forces that are driving these games. But at the same time, um, the publisher needs the brands to be the game. Um, I think there might have been a certain element of naivety back in the day. You know, when we saw kind of people like Hideo Kojima, uh, and Cliffy B, and, and these kind of people elevated. Uh, they were often. It was the, the reason they were elevated was to sell video games, and I think what no one realised at the time was that these people could leave and do their own thing. And I think now there's probably a fear involved um, in in you know people leaving. And, and I think if you knew the name of the person in charge of I don't know uh, the original Assassin's Creed, the guy who who thought that up and pushed it through the system and got it made. Um, you might be more of a fan of that guy than you are of Assassin's Creed. Hmm. Um, and if that guy then goes and joins Activision, are you going to buy the Acti- the new Activision game rather than the Ubisoft game? So I, I can understand why they pulled back from that. But I think for, uh, right now the auteurs are coming up in indie, and that's where you see them. And, and frankly, auteur theory is always an interesting one. I, I don't massively subscribe to it personally, this this idea that there is that you can distill the creative force behind something to to one person or to one entity is to me that's that's 
something that favors the, the person with the name of, of the logo but doesn't actually reflect how things are produced i don't think it's true in film and i don't think it's true in games um for me ota is a marketing method you know the the reason that when you see volume um, marketed it says from the creator of thomas was alone that's not because i'm the guy who made volume i'm not i'm the guy who was in charge of volume but i have a team who've done awesome work it's because i know that that will help sell the game to certain audience people who like the like thomas was alone so for me auteur is a marketing term and i think it makes sense within the indie space right now it made sense within um, mainstream AAA development back when Metal Gear came out I don't think it makes sense with AAA games right now just because of the budget and the scale of production um, I think I think what the situation right now makes more sense this is going to sound a bit of a controversial question but I'm going to put it to the because why not Go for it. Um, do you think like the name Hideo Kojima is a brand because like you've not just got like Metal Gear games, but you've also got things like PT, and like at the end of PT, you see his name Guillermo del Toro there. Like you typically don't see it. Um, like like you say, um, Patrice Desolat presents Assassin's Creed, yeah. or, or 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 Joe Staten and uh, Jason Jones presents Destiny, something like no, that. No, I, I think that's 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 what was created with Hideo Kojima, and undeniably Hideo Kojima has a vision, has a has a creative energy, but presumably. That, that stuff is as inspired or at least in part inspired by, you know, people like, um, you know, the the, the, create, the core creative team around him, you know, the, that core art director, which, uh, what's his... Yoji Shinkawa. Yoji Shinkawa, exactly. He, he's defined, he's as much defined Metal Gear Solid as anyone else, you know, and, and, and it, it makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. Like, I, you know, my, my game, my company's called Bithel Games. Like, I'm not <laughs> in any way aloof about this. Um, it's it's a it's a great marketing um, approach, um, but uh, but yeah, Hideo Kojima sells games. You know, it's a, and it's and I don't think it's a dishonest way to sell it. I'm I you know, the man has a vision and, and he is a, a force to be reckoned with. But um, that's what it is. That's it's a, it's a marketing system. Hmm. Okay. Um, fair enough. Um, so what what other aspects about Metal Gear Solid One? Going back to that, then did you like about it? Um. I think I, uh, one thing that I think I, I mentioned it. I've mentioned it already, but I think deserves a bit more attention is that game aspect. Is the fact that it will always make the decision that serves gameplay and that serves um, whimsical player creativity. Um, so things like the cardboard box, things like using cigarettes to show lasers, um, and that goes throughout the series. So things like shooting out um, explosives in Metal in Gear Solid Two. Uh, using the uh, the I can't remember the name. The SOCOM. The SOCOM. No, no, sorry. The um, stuff like using ice to freeze things. Oh, like oh, the 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 bomb spray, basically. That's the one. Yeah. Um, all of this stuff. All of all of these mechanics are about it being a game. It's 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 Mission Impossible. It's not James Bond. You know, it's it's going for or it's not modern James Bond. It's not Bourne. You know, they're not going for realism. They're going for the the fun option. And I think that's something we've we live in and we have lived in for quite a while now, quite a Poe faced era in action games. Um, you know, every everything's very dark and brown and Metal Gear has always been a franchise that's never been afraid to do the silly thing and to if if it makes sense then go for it. And even if it doesn't make sense, if you can make it convince, then go for it. You know, there's a, a Looney Tunes logic to a lot of Metal Gear Solid, which I massively admire. I wish I had the nerve to do it myself. <laughs> um, what What about the aspects you didn't like about MGS? The aspects I didn't like. Um, I think going back, the, the, there was a lot of control stuff. Um, also, I think there were some choices that were made more for the cinematic quality than for the for the game itself so things like one thing that i was really surprised to go back um and realize i hated was the corner view so when you in mel gear when you approach a corner um the camera kind of flips round and you see past snake down the corridor you're looking down um and that always looked really good on boxes and you know screenshots there's that it's it's a pose that you automatically associate with mel gear I, it, i've ripped it off many times in my screenshots that kind of iconic character leaning against a wall with an enemy walking towards them down the corridor. 
But what it actually does is it puts you in a very precarious position in the game. It lowers your spatial awareness, it challenges you, it, it, it makes things a lot harder um, to understand. And I think um, I don't think that's intentional. I think it's uh, I think that's that's stuff like that. Certain choices that that that, that work when you think that you're trying to create something that looks cinematic and awesome. Uh, but but kind of compromise that core player experience of being the super spy. Um, the the radar as well. I know when I play the game, um, I played it basically in the radar. That soliton radar was was the game. I knew there was other stuff going on on the screen, that kind of that kind of realistic environment stuff. But really, I was playing. I was basically playing Pac Man in the bottom right corner, um, or bottom left. Is it bottom left or bottom right? It's bottom bo- right. Mm. Is it bottom right? No, it's, it's bottom? top right, isn't it? Is it top right? Ah, uh, it's top right. Top right. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, so I, I, I so so with that stuff, I kind of I remember as a kid thinking like, you know, I, I'm I'm not seeing the pretty stuff in this game because I'm playing this game on this little radar. But but so there were there were minor quibbles, but frankly, it's it's like asking me what you know what bothered me about Citizen Kane. You know, it is, and I'm not saying it's the Citizen Kane of video games. I realize I fell down that trap very quickly, but it, <laughs> but it's it is it's incredible. And it's, I think it's one of those games where any quirks, any flaws in the game, I think you can make a very compelling argument that they actually support the game and make it, make the game what it is. Um, it's got a personality which is just so unique. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I've got a lot of love for it. Um, what about the design choices? What, what would you change or tweak in terms of design from the game? <laughs> well, you can play a volume coming soon to... <laughs> 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 um, I think there's a few. I think there's lots of things. Um, I think uh, it's like a lot of stealth games. There is there's a, a real risk that it punishes you too much for failure. Um, just in terms of the time penalty, um, if you're if you're captured um, or seen, um, it can take a lot of time to recover from that, and it can knock you back quite away. Um, it's uh, to be honest, that's a problem of its time as well. That games were less forgiving with checkpointing and stuff like that. I mean, it was pretty cool in that you know you'd enter a new area and it would it would automatically save, but it, it just that that kind of I've messed up to I'm playing again and making progress. Time was a little bit more distant than I would have liked uh, playing it. Um, I think as well, it's it has from a design point of view, it has some winning strategies which which break it in terms of and the, again a very common stealth problem that you do have this kind of instant kill from behind. Well, in Metal Gear Solid, it's a neck snap. Is it three clicks? I think it's three clicks to mm. that. Thing, yeah, uh, that you do. Um, so I think that's a bit too dominant um, and and kind of removes the need to do some of the other kind of mechanics um and then the other kind of again I'm I'm, I'm I'm being incredibly pedantic to pick these things out but things like those awesome power-ups the the bandana and the uh it's not all no the wigs are in two it's a bandana and the invisibility cloak mm. um both of those kind of basically ruin the game um and and i i wonder if there was a way of making them super cool, but also limiting them in some way, just so that they they were ways of changing the game rather than just completely um, overpowering the player. Because I know I know I went back and I I worked to get them, um, but then didn't use them because the game isn't fun if you use them, and if a game's not fun when you use the cool thing you unlock, oh, there's a there's an issue there. But yeah, as I say, I'm I'm being incredibly nitpicky. Um, I, other things I think cover was was dodgy in retrospect. That kind of that push into cover and the camera angle changes that would happen were were confusing and and you know uh, not as bad as Resident Evil, but on the same continuum. Um, what else? What else frustrated me in that game? So many it seems. <laughs> well, like I said, I'm nitpicking. Like, and then also as well, you have to bear in mind that you know my job for the last two years has been nitpicking Metal Gear Solid and okay. trying to change things. So oh. I'm, I'm, yeah, I love this game. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's touch upon quickly um, the other Metal Gear games um, mm-hmm. uh, as well as the future. Um, uh, so. Just to kind of stay on MGS1, but kind of move it forward slightly. Um, you mentioned you, uh, the Twin Snakes. Um, yeah. Like, um, how how did you find that? Because like I've seen a lot of people not like that game because like it felt like 
too crazy even for Metal Gear standards? Yeah, I think I can't. I'm not. I'm stealing this, but I, I saw it referred to once as the kind of Disney theme park version of Metal Gear Solid One, <laughs> and, and I can't. I can't remember. I can't attribute that quote, but it's so perfectly true. Like basically, it is. It's Metal Gear reimagined. Um, with just ridiculous scale and speed and i can't remember they brought in a specific um stunt choreographer didn't they and, and directors that do redo the cutscene. so you have snake jumping off of rockets in midair and and kicking bullets and doing various weird stuff for me it felt it was fun i think mechanically it was great to go re to revisit shadow moses with those those Metal Gear Solid 2 tools, um, you know, in terms of environment interactions, hanging off rails, first-person camera stuff, all of those kind of things. It was fun to do. Um, and it's it's just a nice, hyper-realized version. But, yeah, it's it, it does go too far. I also, the voice acting was re-recorded, and I think in a few places didn't quite work as well. Um, it, it, was, it was a cast who knew that they were in a, a big-budget video game all of a sudden, and I think there's a, there's a charm to the kind of the the uh, the humility i guess of the original vo recordings um whereas i think a few of the actors got a little bit a little bit proud of themselves in the redo um but yeah it's it's a it's a great it's a great addition um i don't think it supplants it though and and when i go back to play metal gear solid i, I go back to play metal gear solid one mm-hmm. um that was another bit i actually wanted to touch upon for mgs1 original um uh in terms of the voicing uh that i completely forgot about um like if you remember, like Mei Ling and uh, Naomi, they're both English and Chinese speaking in the PS1 PC version. But in Twin Snakes, they're American in the MGS4 as well. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a retcon. Yep, yep, that happened. Oops. It happened. I mean, I I can understand. I, I actually I can't understand it to be honest. Like it, I I I'm sure it made sense. Maybe it was the actresses wanted to. To, do, to change things up or or didn't want to redo the same thing. I can understand with Mei Ling that there was a certain kind of potentially racist element to the depiction. I guess if you really, I'm not sure, I'm not sure there is, but I, I can see how that would be a concern potentially. Um, so there's a few things, but no, I, I, yeah, I, I, I prefer them the original way around. Mm. Um, MGS2, um, I want to get your thoughts on MGS2 because it is basically MGS1 but with a new skin. Well, not that's that's harsh. That's harsh because I do love MGS2. But um, it it just it basically being uh Shadow Moses at least for you know three quarters of the game. Animals. Absolutely, and comes up with an interesting kind of story justification for that. But yeah, it is. It's it's a retread. I mean, they the the interesting thing with with two is is the introduction of verticality to the game in a big way. In terms of hanging off of things, jumping up on blocks, these kind of things that that weren't present in the original. Um, I I loved to. I remember really adoring to um, and replaying it lots and lots. And again, because I wasn't um, really paying attention to games media at that point, because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a gamer in the way that I am now. Mm. Um, I had no idea when I loaded it up and suddenly. Um, uh, Raiden was the main character. I I didn't have a clue, and for whatever reason, the first time I played it, I didn't play the tanker first. So I had no idea why Snake suddenly was played by a different actor and was blonde. <laughs> it took me because I, mean, so, I they refer to him as Snake, don't they, for the first kind of half hour of that game? Yeah, until yeah. you realise he's someone else. So that threw me off. So I I loved that. Um, yeah, I, I I really enjoyed too. I thought it was a, a great refinement. I remember. Um, getting really into it obviously it was ridiculously impressive visually for its time oh absolutely and leaps and bounds ahead of everyone else um and yeah for me it, it felt like it delivered everything i want from a sequel it did more of the same but, but better and bigger um it was it was not the departure that three was but to be honest three was the point where that went a bit too far from me from the kind of the, the stuff that I love. So yeah, two for me felt like the kind of a solid, um, a solid iteration. The story I think works less well. I think it, it you know, the, um, the universe was just wacky enough in one um, that we, it was still basically a story about terrorists taking over a facility and trying to get a nuclear weapon. Um, and, and, you know, yes, you introduce, 
you know, shape-shifting masters of disguise and um, psychomantis and various different things into that, but it still remained understandable within the context of like an 80s realist action movie, whereas two went completely off the rails in a in a fantastic way. But again, I think perhaps pushed things a bit too silly. I think that balance went a bit off. I think they redressed that though in three and four. I think it kind of it went back to kind of normal levels. Um, so yeah, I I, uh, I love to. I, I really enjoyed to. Um, and it has it's a shame. It's the, the the bad guys. They're not quite up there with one, but there are some brilliant brilliant characters in that game. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely agree on that. Um, I could talk more at length about MGS two if I can, but uh, we, we will. We won't get into that, at least not today, anyways. <laughs> um, so, there was another bit that you touched upon earlier, and that, and that was your love for the series is through, you know, the characters and the story. And um, I want to get your kind of thoughts on this, because, like, for those who don't know who are listening, um, I wrote a thing last year on Metal Gear Saul and its treatment of female characters. Now, this is going to be very controversial, admittedly, for those listening, <laughs> but um, basically, I don't think Metal Gear Solid, at least recently, anyways, has kind of gotten female uh, character treatment very well done. Like, it's, and it's more speci- especially Kojima. Like, I think it's safe to say, like, with him in charge, the blame can easily lay at his feet. Now... That is the downside of the O2 theory. Yeah. Um... Uh, no, don't get me wrong. There, he has done some incredible female characters like um, Naomi, Meryl, and abso- the, boss, the right. boss. Like, absolutely the boss. I could talk anyone's ear off all day about how incredibly done the boss is uh, from MGS3. But that you can hear back uh, from earlier in the season with Lee Alexander. Mm-hmm. That said... Um, um, the, he's not really kind of done it justice as of late, has he? No, I think and I think part of that is rooted in the way he sees women um, in stories and their role in stories. I remember, I think at the same BAFTA thing you mentioned, someone asked a question about this. Might have been, was it you? Well, did you ask a question about I, 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 did, I did ask about the boss, but not... I think I, it might have been, it might have been, I can't remember, but someone asked a question, and I remember he used the phrase... Um, uh, he was talking about about women in games, and he said that there are basically two kinds of women that he likes to tell stories about. I think I know. Um, who, I think I knew who it was. I think it was Helen Lewis of the New Statesman. It might have been okay. Um, and the, his his answer was, yeah, he, he he likes to tell stories about two kinds of women: uh, mothers and girlfriends. Mm. Um, and what I mean, the obvious problem there is it's not necessarily that's not sexist in the sense that he said he stood on stage that i don't like women and i don't want to tell stories about them but oh. the problem is i think all of his female characters are defined by their relationship to a male character and specifically to the player character now in fairness there is the argument that you can make that when you're playing a video game you're the locus of the game you're the focus everyone's relationships should be with you and if you're playing as a male character which you predominantly are in video games um, then, then there's gonna inevitably every female character in a game is going to be defined in relationship to a male character. However, um, there are ways of doing that that are less focused, <laughs> I guess, than this. So that's my that's my issue with with his characters. You don't get the feeling they exist for any reason beyond um, Snake, um, Mei Ling. That was her role. You know, she was a save button, and she was a save button that told you how awesome you were every time you clicked her. Um, and I, in, it, while I think some of his characters do better than that, and yeah, the boss is fantastic. The boss is still defined as a maternal relationship with Snake. That's that's yeah, like Kojima. Yeah, like Kojima literally said that to me when I put it to him uh, at the back of the event a couple of years ago. Like, like she is based uh, on a motherly. Uh, paternal instinct of sorts yeah and i think that's fine but i think that's a very narrow view of what what, what how to define women and in stories you know uh, i should, would hope it was obvious that you know you there are reasons women do things that have nothing to do with a man um <laughs> and it's and it was and it's it, i was disappointed by that answer i'll be honest but um 
Yeah, I, I don't think it comes from a negative place, but I think that might be a blinker in his in his thinking about writing female characters. Mm. And like all the stars of late, like um, there's how he treated um, Paz in Ground Zeroes, and uh, how Quiet has been designed for the Phantom Pain as well. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, which kind of segues nicely in the um, MGS Five then. Um, like, what what are your thoughts of Ground Zeroes, and like, how 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 are you uh, are you excited for Phantom Pain? I am, I am. I've, I've, you know, I'm, I'm a Metal Gear fan, so I've been keeping an eye, and I, I also know a couple of people involved in producing it, so I, I, I talk to them about it, and the, the, I know the, the, the aims of the team are incredibly exciting in terms of what they're trying to do, in terms of interactivity, and in terms of kind of taking stealth forward. I think it's cool. Um, I think, like I said, since three, I'd say the mainline Metal Gear games have moved in a rea- in a, in a direction of realism that isn't what originally drew me to the game. Um, I enjoyed Metal Gear Acid more than I enjoyed Metal Gear Solid 4. You know, I like I like that gaminess and that kind of puzzle game element of the Metal Gear of old. And I understand why they've moved on. It's absolutely fair enough. Um, so I expect that to continue, and I'm, I'm going to be pleasantly surprised if they, if they remember to keep the sense of humour and to keep the silliness. But, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed Ground Zeroes. I think... It suffered from its length. I think about the moment where I started to feel, oh, I'm getting this. I'm actually, I'm working out so interesting solutions to the problem. The, the game had ended. And I know there's lots of options to replay and do things differently, but, you know, the credits rolled and I was on to the next game, frankly. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm definitely, I'm going to be playing it the day it comes out. Mm. Um, yeah, absolutely. I can't, I can't wait to uh, kind of dig my teeth into that. Uh, considering, considering that that was Ground Zero is actually the first time where it made me realise that I'm actually excited for the Phantom Pain, not for its story, because I, I think to be quite bluntly honest, like with everything that happened at the end of Ground Zero, is kind of it made me less excited for the story but at the same yes. time i'm i'm more excited for the phantom pain because of its gameplay side because like it that kind of sandbox to it that kind of sandbox in, fa- in the phantom pain that that tease and ground zeros of what you can do is just fascinating and intriguing yeah no i'd agree with that i think um yeah obviously i i share your i definitely share your concerns over over some of the elements of the uh, the story in in that game, but yeah, the uh, the new one, yeah, I think it's 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 all going to be about that open world. It's all going to be about the about how they take Metal Gear into an open world. That's not something we've seen in a stealth game, really. Like we see stealth ga- stealth mechanics incorporated into larger scale games, but I think this will be the first open world bespoke stealth game I can think of, at least. And I'm excited to see where they take that. And I can imagine for for Kojima as well that's where the interest lies. He's he's done the kinds of the kind of Metal Gear game that, that I love and I want. He's made that game two times already, three times, three, two and a half times already. Um, I can totally understand him wanting to to branch out and try and push things further. And fair play to him. Top three MGS games. What would you go for? Obviously, won't be at the top. Um, I would say one very closely followed by two. Um, and then, yeah, Metal Gear Acid. I really enjoyed the Acid series. Um, I actually prefer those two kind of the portable ops stuff. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed Acid. And I, don't think, I don't think many people remember that game. It kind of got lost. Hmm. It's more of a card battling, tile based uh, Metal Gear. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I remember wanting to get Metal Gear Acid for my PSP at launch. So. It's a very, it's a very interesting way of how to handle that. Um, it's a very interesting way of uh, looking at the series through a different lens. Yeah, no, I thought so. I thought so. Honorable mentions. Honorable mentions. Let's do it. For me, um, the kind of the big influences are. I mean, Deus Ex. I'm obsessed with. Um, very, very fortunate to have met and chatted with Warren Spector a few times now, and I just he's he is so absolutely and completely as awesome as I always hoped he would be as a teenager. Um, so that's good. Um, so I, I love Deus Ex. Um, 
I'm also obviously Half Life. That's kind of that's that's cliche enough to be boring, so I won't even bother going into that. But obviously, that's a great game. Um, what else? What else? The ones that really stand out to me. Shenmue uh, inspired me at an age where I hadn't really considered that such a scale of game was possible. Um, so that will always be one that I have a very special place in my heart for. Um, other than that, I guess my a game I often say is one of my favourites. Most recent games is uh, Hitman Blood Money. I thought was absolutely just the perfect crystallisation of what Hitman's been up to this point. Um, so yeah, Hitman Blood Money as well. So you can see there that's you know we're they're mostly stealth games. They're mostly games that are focused on that that kind of thinking. Deus Ex for me, it's about the um, the choices available in that game. I don't mean the kind of the big overarching story stuff. That's cool. It's nice to have different endings, but more the the choices in application of mechanics that you can really play. That it's 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 role playing in a literal sense that you can choose exactly how you're going to approach each mission and just. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> I play them generally as like stealthy snipers in Deus Ex generally. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really solid experience. Half-Life, I mean, obviously redefined storytelling in video games. It took a lot of the the tools that Kojima added to the toolbox. Well, it came out the same year, right? I think um, Half-Life and Metal Gear. So it's probably, yeah. probably a fallacy for me to imply that it stole too heavily from Metal Gear because they probably haven't played it. But it's... Um, it's 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 very cinematic in its use of music and its use of mise en scène and voice acting. It did loads of things, um, but then it actually also played incredibly strongly to the medium and it knew how to use first person. Uh, Valve still absolutely um, lead the way in terms of in terms of how they use that that player as cameraman um, and, and where they place the player and how they make the player draw the player's attention to story moments and all this kind of stuff so so here, so so half-life i still go back to half-life and half-life 2 every now and again and just just marvel at how how perfect those tricks were and obviously they've stolen everything mm. um and then uh shenmue for me that was just the idea of a game where you lived in a city like that was that was so fresh. I'd not played the GTA games at that point because I was um, I was too young and I wasn't allowed. Uh, so I think Shenmue came in the gap between two and three. So it was the first 3D kind of game which which had that kind of scope. And obviously, looking back at it, there was a lot of very clever trickery. It was a much smaller game than it felt, but it used uh, routine and, and scale of space to just to make it feel like you were living a life um, in a way that has been ripped off by, by many games since. And then you can see that, that influence that that game had. I'd love to see more Shenmue. I never will, but I'd love to. Um, I, I mentioned Shenmue on Twitter the other day and I've now got like four Twitter bots following me that just tweet Shenmue stuff at me all the time. It seems to be a very small, but very uh, strong willed group of people who want Shenmue to return to fair play. Um, and then, uh, and then Hitman Blood Money just is the most beautiful of the Hitman games. Beautiful might be the wrong word, but I think Hitman Blood Money, for me, just nailed every aspect of the series I love. That kind of incredibly dark sense of humour uh, that permeates the whole series um, and is just nasty and dirty and cruel and horrible in a really delicious way. Um, but also mechanically really, really solid um, in the way it presents choices to you, the way it allows you to choose you know, specific tactics and, and paths through a level. Um, it's, I would say Hitman is probably the most successful of the genre of stealth game that allows choice, that allows you to you know, shoot up a room if you want to or to do different things, take different approaches. Hitman presents that, I think, in a way that's just supremely well-balanced. Uh, and doesn't doesn't lose any player along the way. Basically, provides you with the experience you want to have, which I, I think I think it does very well. It's, a lot of games try and emulate that and, and don't pull it off as well. And yeah, for me, Blood Money is the uh, is the, the the pinnacle of that. If I put it to you, um, what would be your top three ever? Obviously, one MGS won't be at the top, but what top would you three video games ever. I would I would probably I would have Hitman and Deus Ex filling out those second two spots. Probably Deus Ex just a little bit higher.
Do you think we're heroes, Rob? Do you think anyone will sing songs about what we did tonight? I believe they will. I have to believe they will. I was always told my family protected the people. And I want to try and make good on that. Um, uh, when I was talking to someone for, uh, at the end of last year, um, around Christmas time, someone who's been on the show before, um, uh, he put it to me as if it was um, Metal Gear Biffle, his exact <laughs> words. Nice. I think I think it's it's certainly it certainly owes a great deal to Metal Gear, and I think I'm hoping it, it's compared favorably. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope that's not a, a, a horrible albatross around its neck, but I. But yeah, it's it's definitely inspired by those. I think I try and when when describing it, I try and compare it to the way you know Mario clearly had an effect on Fez. You know that kind of there is a there is a, a root there. There's you know young Mike seeing playing Metal Gear Solid dreaming of his own stealth game um and that's that's certainly there um but the hope was really to take the stuff the feeling i had playing metal gear solid and try and create that for a new audience um and yeah a lot of that was was playing old stealth games that kind of arcadey puzzle era and finding the places where i thought they were successful and the places where you know things stood out to me as as, as not having aged very well and try and solve all those problems. Um, and then, of course, the other big part of it for me that's really important is the um, user-generated content aspect, that, that basically I'm providing you with all of the Lego set. Um, and the game is very modular in that it's, it's, you know, you place down pieces to create interesting puzzles. Um, and I just really wish I'd had that as a kid. I remember seeing a making of documentary about uh, Metal Gear Solid Two. I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I remember and, that. Yeah, and then ta- and Hideo Kojima talking about um, using Lego to design Shadow Moses. And as a kid, that blew me away. The idea that you could place down bricks and plan out what what a stealth game would be, um, and that's what volume hopefully delivers is that tool set. Um, so I've taken that very seriously. I want to I want to provide that. That, that toy uh, to hopefully a large audience. So, um, user generated content is always interesting in that it's it's always used by far fewer players than than you expect. <laughs> so I'm not expecting it to be the defining way of playing volume. Um, but I I'd love this to be the first tool someone uses to make a level and maybe get into game development. By the way, I don't think the Metal Gear Biffle meant, uh, comment was meant to be a kind of slight. I think it was meant for observation of sorts. Of course, no, and I, I totally get it. I think as well, one thing that's playing into that, cause it's, and I, I don't take offence to that, I find it massively complimentary. Um, I think the game's visuals as well are reminiscent of VR missions, and I can uh, you know, for very obvious reasons, there's a lot of inspiration taken there, obviously. Um, I think it plays, it feels different to Metal Gear. Um, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's Metal Gear, I think, if Metal Gear was made now. So we, we use cover system mechanics from Splinter Cell and we, 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 uh, our interactions are much more similar to, say, Mark of the Ninja. It's, 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 hopefully it, it feels different, more different to Metal Gear than it looks, if you know what I mean. And obviously no yeah. one's going to know that yet. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's coming along well. And I, I, yeah, I, I, I hope it's taken on its own terms as well, but... I'm massively flattered by the comparison. Um, so, for those who don't know, like about the, uh, the background of Volume, um, give the elevator pitch on what they expect. So, yeah, so Volume Volume is a stealth game uh, where you don't have the primary um, option that you have in every stealth game of bopping characters on the back of the head. Um, there is no killing in Volume. Uh, you finish a level with as many enemies up and about and trying to kill you as were in there when you started. Um, so you have to instead use all the cool stuff that you kind of ignore in most stealth games to evade them. So you've got a bunch of different gadgets and abilities and environmental interactions. It's about being clever. It's about being the cleverest guy in the room and stealing everything by being the cleverest guy in the room. You mentioned how the VR vibe, uh, the VR missions vibe of volume, um, there was another aspect of it that I only caught my eye today. Um, I, I was looking at a screenshot of um, Metal Gear Solid 1, incidentally uh, enough, and um, uh, more specifically, there was one part of it that caught my eye, and um, it was the Soliton radar. Yeah. Uh, and I, my first thought was, 
how that one small aspect of Metal Gear Solid 1 wholly reminds me of volume as a whole game. Yeah, and that was that was absolutely kind of critical when we were working out exactly what this game was going to be. That was that was part of the, the thinking was basically as I said to you earlier, when I played um Metal Gear, I played it in that bottom right or sorry, <laughs> top corner. Um and that was I wanted to make that game. I wanted to make a game where you weren't where you weren't fl- flicking your attention between it. And I'm not the only game to do this. A lot of games have visual, uh, you know, vision cones now in the in the in the game space. Oh, of course. Yeah. But but yeah, it's absolutely um, absolutely about putting all of that information into the environment um, and and conveying that through the 3D space, so you're not looking away. Um, that's for me. That's a big part of stealth game design is that you essentially you start on the back foot because you've got a character who's weak. Hmm. You've got a character who can't own a space. Um, so for, if you want to make an experience that's empowering, then it becomes about um, working out how to give that player um, strength through other means. And, and the way that we choose to do it is through information. So you have absolute awareness of your environment. Uh, that means a pulled out camera. That means vision cones drawn into the level. That means that you can see how far noise travels. Um, lots of things like that. So we, we really do everything we can to to help you understand your environment immediately and and and, and quickly as well, and that allows our game to to move a lot faster and to for, for there to be less moments of cowering in the corner, wondering what the hell you're going to do next. Just to slightly touch upon Thomas was alone then uh, in regards to volume. Um, how did you find the kind of jump shock uh, from Thomas was alone to volume in terms of increased production value because it, it is obviously a bigger game in terms of production than it was. Yeah, um, well I mean the first thing to say is is if you're using Unity um, it's basically the same on a functional level to make a cube moving around in a space as a square, like it's basically the same thing. Volume's a 2D game in terms of its mechanics. You are still locked into and playing in a two-dimensional space. There's no jump button, um, so it's still it's still the same kind of depth of movement, um, and yeah, that that works. I think um, yes, in terms of production value, in terms of the amount of graphics that you're seeing on screen and the bigger cast and all this stuff, that was really just a case of, of going to people who I'd met throughout my career and asking them if they wanted to kind of try this silly thing with me. Um, and the first of them was, was Daz Watford, who's the art director, mm. um, who I hired. He quit his day job to work on volume, um, and i always be very grateful for that. Um, and, yeah, we built a team around the game, um, and it's let me flex my muscles and, and do you know push into areas that I'd not done before, things with shaders and, and 3D stuff that, that I'd never had to implement myself personally. Um, and also it's it's meant that I can work with a team and, and do interesting stuff so it's it's been a fun it's been fun jumping that that level but it's you know it's it's meant more time you know Thomas was alone took about two years to make uh, in evenings and weekends volume is probably gonna end up taking about two and a half ish years um, and that's full time so it's it's a it's a significantly bigger job. Um, but I'm really happy with where the game is. I think we're gonna, I think we've got something good. Um, uh, obviously, we'll we'll let players decide ultimately. You mentioned uh, about yourself there um, a while ago, talking about Metal Gear and the kind of big voice and culture in 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 the in the industry at the time and even now. Um, so be reminiscent of me if I didn't you know talk about you know adding Andy Circus to the game. <laughs> I yeah, he's uh, he's he's a very cool chap. Um, who, yeah, um, slummed it with us basically for an afternoon. Um, and uh, no, he was, uh, we, we kind of, I'd, you know, obviously been trying to cast the role for a while and uh, had had a few failures in that and hadn't quite got anywhere with anyone. Um, and I was kind of thinking, well, let's double down. Let's, let's not, let's not keep going down this list of, you know, less and less right people. Let's actually try and get the perfect person for this role. And the, the that person was Andy Serkis, and somehow we managed to talk him into it. He was he was into the script, I think, basically. I think that's what, what happened was he saw a script for a, a villain that he thought he fancied playing. Um, but he was brilliant, and he chose the scenery just beautifully. Um, so, yeah, got very lucky and, and found a slot in his schedule that, 
the worked. It was it was one of those scenarios where it was it was very um, it was very very scary at times because he basically we got a message from his agent saying you know Andy likes the script he wants to be in the game um, but he's you know he's making Star Wars right now um, and he's making he's working on Avengers and he's doing stuff with Marvel in general um, so the essentially we were told at some point in the next two or three months. If Andy has an afternoon free, um, uh, we will give you a call, and you have to get a studio and meet him at that studio and do it. Um, <laughs> and or it might never happen, or we might call you in two months and say, "No, sorry, it's not going to happen." Um, if you want to take that chance, go for it. So we did, and yeah, we got the we got the call, and you know, Andy's free next week for the afternoon. Make it happen, um, and we fortunately managed to get everything kind of put together in time to do it but it was yeah it was touch and go but but yeah he was he's brilliant and very charming man very very good actor um and yeah i i think we got a great performance out of him mm. i think it's worth saying as well of course it's worth mentioning um volume does have charlie mcdonald and um danny wallace yep. uh just to make sure we don't uh, miss out on them as well yeah, we've got them. We've got um, a guy called John Dow um, and Catherine McCall as well doing other voices for the game. So yeah, we've got a, a big cast this time around. It's uh, it's exciting. And yeah, Danny's back, and you know Danny's kind of a good luck charm at this point. Uh, it was never really in question whether he would find a role for him. And in fact, I wrote a role for him. I want him in the game so much. So he plays the kind of office paperclip of the volume um, who who strikes up a relationship with with Rob, the player character, who's yeah played by Charlie. McDonald, who's kind of a, a big YouTuber, who's uh, who's been absolutely fantastic, and he's a big gamer, so he's I think he's enjoyed kind of seeing behind the scenes of a game getting made as well. So it's uh, it's all gone very well. Um, you said Danny Wallace was a kind of good luck charm at this point. Game three, surely. Um, I I, I would never. He'll be in it. I'll put him somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> if he wants, if he wants to keep working, he he with with us. He's um. He's been really great and really supportive, um, and always gone way beyond what he has to do um, in terms of helping us with like promotion and stuff. So he's been absolutely fantastic, um, and he's also just a fantastic voice actor who who delivers just really really strong performances. So yes, I'm I'm pro- pretty sure I'll keep asking him um, <laughs> whether he keeps saying yes is ultimately up to him. Mm. Um. So obviously, volume uh, you know takes place in one of the biggest folklore stories of all time, Robin Hood. But um, prepping for this, like I found out that you were planning it around Sherlock Holmes, which is very interesting because like I don't know if you've made this public yet or not, and if I, and if you haven't, I apologise belatedly, but um, <laughs> or profusely even I beg your pardon for the wrong use of word. Um, but you released a screenshot, or a title card screenshot, of um, one of the episode titles from the current Sherlock reboot. And that's a good spot. Um, I'll, I'll immediately nip that in the bud by saying that that's, that was just because my girlfriend was watching that episode, and I needed some placeholder text. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's, there's nothing... But yes, it was going to be Sherlock Holmes originally. Um, well, it was very briefly, like we're talking a matter of weeks. I was kind of feeling around for a story. I knew I wanted to tell... A British story, um, kind of something, something I could key into that was that, that had a bit of history, and you know Sherlock Holmes made sense. The idea of kind of trying to solve crimes by reproducing them seemed like an interesting hook to me. Um, but yeah, ultimately it seemed a bit pointless to do because obviously modern Sherlock Holmes is being done very successfully right now on the BBC. It seemed like uh, there was no point repeating that. So um, so yeah, it became Robin Hood through research, obviously kind of looking at thieves and thinking about cool stories to tell about thieves it doesn't take very long to find you know rob loxley and his merry men and and start thinking about what how that could be kind of transposed to uh to a modern or you know near future setting do you um ever see yourself doing a kind of sherlock game not necessarily in a modern twist it doesn't i don't think it would have to be i'm I'm intrigued by the idea of the idea of doing a kind of a um investigative detective game really appeals to me it's something that you don't see i've heard the new sherlock holmes game is quite good i've not tried it yet the uh i forget the developer but the the one that came out very recently Mm, Um, 
Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I've not seen the problem with detective fiction is well, there's lots of problems with detective fiction, but the main problem is that you're not a genius. Um, not you specifically, any of us. <laughs> with playing as Sherlock Holmes, I can't be Sherlock Holmes. I, I'm not as clever as that character is. Arguably, no one in history has ever been as clever as that character is. So therefore, it becomes how do you make the player feel clever? And if you're making them feel clever, how do you make that not feel fake? And, and those kind of challenges are interesting. The idea of doing like a, like a Sherlock Holmes, like an Agatha Christie, doing a, a detective game that actually really makes you solve something rather than just kind of using that as a as a veneer really appeals to me but i haven't worked out to do it yet i'm hoping i do at some point because i'd love to do a detective game one day so like uh, like i said robin hood is like the biggest one, one of the biggest if not the biggest folklore story at least coming from the uk animals but mm-hmm. like in terms of future projects would you be interested in exploring other folklore aspects or even like I know you said in the past like you'd be even open the a volume or Thomas was alone sequel but like would you be interested in exploring other kind of folklore stories like Robin Hood it's something that interests me so with um, Thomas was alone we did a DLC called Benjamin's Flight which was basically Icarus mm. um, did Icarus and that was fun to do and, uh, that was what kind of inspired me to want to do that again at a bigger scale um volume i think there's room for a sequel there's definitely with robin hood there's quite a few different stories and this is very much based on the kind of the origin of robin hood story um and and that's that's there's definitely room to expand on that and i we you know we leave a a few hooks in the game that if if we want to do a sequel we can um i'd like to i'd like to explore that that world a bit more ultimately though you know again it's got a lot to do with how well the game does and whether people like it because there's very little point making a sequel to a massively unpopular game um we'll see how it goes down um but yeah i i'm honestly i i like the idea of continuing to look for stories in strange places um, the thing that appealed about Robin Hood was that it's a story that has been retold so many times um, and at various different points in history that it, the, the, the act of retelling Robin Hood is the interesting thing and what you choose to bring to it, how your politics come onto it, how your ideas of character come onto the relationships between the, between Robin Hood and other characters. Um, so I think I'll probably do more adaptation-y stuff. I'm interested in the idea of adaptation, whether that's going back to folklore, whether that's maybe working with an existing IP, you know, maybe doing a, a game based on someone else's license at some point. Or whatever, really. I've got a lot of different areas I could go down, and I'm not gonna not gonna decide yet, to be honest. Um, but yeah, if volume successful, I have every intention of of going back to that world. Um, and Thomas was alone. I, I I always said I wouldn't do a sequel uh, because I couldn't think of any ideas for one, and I've since had an idea. So at some point, I might go back to that one too. Oh. I don't know yet. We'll see. Oh, I thought, I thought, I swore I've always heard you say you could be open to a sequel for Thomas. Oh, I've never, I've never ruled it out, but I, oh. I, I think I always said that it would need to be a good idea that justifies it, and I think I've got a good idea, so <laughs> I, that might justify it. We'll see, we'll see what happens. So, volume, definitely coming this year. Yep. For PS4, PS Vita first, then PC. Yep. Rob. Yeah? This is the right solution, yes? Twitter's probably the best place to keep an eye on me and my uh, 
the well, the boring minutai of my life, and, uh, and and specifically how volumes going. So I'm at Mike Bithell on Twitter. I talk a bit too much, but I'm reasonably interesting. I think most of the time. Um, and then yes, volume will be out later in the year uh, for the uh, well for the PS4 and the Vita and PC, as you say. Um, please buy that because that's what pays my bills. Um, and uh, <laughs> fingers crossed, uh, people like it. Nuclear. 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 Is it nuclear? Nuclear. Uh, I always pronounce it as nuclear, not nuclear. Or nuclear. I, is it nuclear or nuclear? I I don't know. Nuclear. I always say nuclear. I always say nuclear. That sounds better. It sounds <laughs> like you're doing it right, and I'm doing it incredibly wrong and embarrassingly badly. Yes. I don't. N- nuclear. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, nuclear. That's that's just saying nuclear. nuclear. Yeah, nuclear. <laughs> I like it. Some